This morning's subject is the secret of the sperm. Last December, hundreds of scientists met in Montreal and read their papers to each other. Naturally, the entire world printed what they had to say. Fortunately for me, the Los Angeles Times carried it daily. I must confess, everyone really fired me. But one in particular interested me. And this scientist read a paper on the sperm. He said the sperm remains as much a mystery today as it was when man first became curious about its nature. And then he made this little statement. The sperm somehow easily passes through the surface of an egg. Although, the outside of the egg has no holes in it, either before or after fertilization. Well, that fired me. On the morning of the 19th of February, I was lying in bed quite early, thinking of this strange mystery of the sperm, and wondering all about it. And suddenly I felt myself detached from this body. I was not in my room, but I was in a room, and the room was sealed. There was no entrance, no exit, just a sealed room. But as I entered it, it became alive, it became animated. Then I thought of my bed, my body, and in one moment I am back on my bed. I thought of another detachment. I'm in an entirely different room, but it's also sealed. How I got in, I do not know other, but I simply imagined myself away from my body. I did not single out the room. The room was completely sealed. No entrance, no exit. Then I thought, here are these unnumbered states of consciousness. You can't number them. You can liken each state to an egg. And every state remains just like the egg until fertilized. And the presence that fertilizes the egg is simply our consciousness. We must be in it to activate it, to animate it. You could this very moment single out any state and by the use of your imagination imagine that you're in it you'd be in it think this very moment of your living room or any room in your house take an object a familiar object in your room and bring it as close as you can if it's really here well then you can't be here in this room as you become intense about it concentrated on it you are really where you are imagining yourself to be. For man being all imagination, he must be where he is in imagination. But what have I done there? I've fertilized it. I've actually made it real. And in a way that I do not know, I'm going to go there. But now you will say, naturally, I'm going to go there today. It's my home. I use that only to illustrate a point. You could take any place. No matter where it is, any part of the world, if you did the same thing to it that you would now do to your home, you will find yourself compelled to move across a bridge of incident leading up to the fulfillment of that state. You don't devise the means, but there are so many little facets to this wonderful art of imagining. I'll tell you one to show you the danger. When one wants one thing, above all things in this world, and they're willing to sacrifice their moral, ethical code, in fact, every code. It also works. That's why I warned you in my last book, I can only acquaint you with the law and leave you to your choice and its risk. And I mean risk. I call this lady a friend. She is a friend. 
I'm not here to judge anyone in the world. And she is my friend living in New York City. When she was a young girl, she was as poor as a church mouse. She had nothing. Her only claim to recognition was the fact she descended physically from the Adamses, our presidents. And she was very proud of that fact, very proud. But she had no money. The one thing she wanted above everything in this world was money. And I don't mean a few hundred thousand dollars. I mean money in the true sense of the word. To the disgust of her parents, she used to always pretend she had fabulous fortunes. She is not, may I say, a good-looking lady, either in form or in feature. Nice in many other respects, but you could never accuse her of being a beautiful woman. But nevertheless, she dreamed this state. And she just simply wanted money. At a party one day, she met a young man, just a few years her senior. He had money. Multiple millions. She had nothing. She had a physical line leading to the Adamses. He had oodles of money. His line led to one of the bishops of New York State. I do not say this to, in any way, discourage you in your admiration of some bishop or some man of the cloth, but his grandfather was a bishop in New York State. He knew all the lovely parcels of, well, real estate, where tomorrow, if he could hold on to it, what it would be worth. And so here's a bishop of the church Instead of taking care of his flock, he was taking care of his pocket. And he left millions to this man's father, who in turn left it to him. My friend only wanted money. And so in no time flat, they got married. And they lived for 21 years in intimate hostility. Really. Solid beyond measure. I wouldn't dare discuss it from the platform. So at the end of these 21 years, they called it the day and divided the millions. She still wanted more millions. She could open Tiffany with her diamonds and her jewelry. Still wanted more. She had a little cousin who always worked for a salary. But he got in on the ground floor when our huge big corporations of the day were being organized. Saved his money, he was a bachelor, he lived alone, very frugal, and he bought a little bit of this stock, a little bit of that, never touched it. It split and split and split and split. Year before last, he had the presence of mind to die. <laughs> the only member of his family that would ever see him was this lady. She knew in some strange way he had money. She would bring him home for an occasional dinner, would call him on the phone. So when they found his will, she was the only member of the family named in the will. He has other first cousins, but they were above it all. They came from the Adamses, and he must be on the outside or something but he was not what they would cultivate. When the will was read, my friend and my friend alone got it. The last estimate, they're still finding it. He put it in this bank, in that box, in the other box, well over a million. The stocks and bonds are worth, and she got it all. Now her cousins aren't speaking to her, because she got it. The price she paid for money, I hope that no one here will be willing to pay. She could have had all the millions she now has, plus happiness. She could have, if she only knew the law. You want it, but you condition it. You want it with dignity. 
that statement of Milligan. I have a lavish, steady, dependable income, consistent with integrity and mutual benefit. That's our great Milligan. He was a poor boy too, and he grew tired of his poverty. And the story is told me by the one who interviewed him after he got the prize, the Nobel Prize, in this cosmic ray studies. And he said to her, the interviewer, I was a poor boy, raised in a nice environment. My father was a traveling minister. He had no money, but he gave us good books. We were always playing games, he, a strong body and a strong mind. But he had a coat, a decent coat. And so I wanted money, but I wanted it in this manner. So I locked myself in a room one day. I did not have even a glass of water for 16 hours. And in that interval, I repeated over and over and over to myself this thought that I wrote out. I have, in the present tense, I have a lavish, steady, dependable income, consistent with integrity and mutual benefit. Well, he certainly earned it. He had all these things when he died. He had the respect of the world. He gave to the world as much or more than they gave to him. Yes, he had millions. But look what he gave to the world. That's how he wanted it. My friend could have done something similar. But no, she wanted money. And she was willing to pay the price, any price, and how she has paid it. So I warn you, yes, you bought something. And the thing to, that will fertilize it is your own wonderful human imagination. But you know exactly what you want, occupy it. I find one of the great fallacies of the world is perpetual construction, deferred occupancy. We know what we want, but we leave it out there and hope that the passing of time will make it. It won't do it. I have to occupy it and make there here. I make then, now, and dwell in it just as though it were true. And if I dwell in it just as though it's true, though one second later, the phone rings and breaks the spell, or someone calls me, or I wake from it, I have fertilized it. You go into the state and you fertilize it. I may not recognize my harvest when it comes in new season. It'll come. May not come tonight, may not come tomorrow, but it will come because I fertilized it. I went into a state, occupied it, and the whole thing becomes fertilized. But every egg has its own appointed hour, and it ripens and it will flower. If to me it seemed long, then I must wait, for it is sure, and it will not be late. These infinite states of the world are waiting for occupancy, waiting to be fertilized by us. That's why we must become so extremely discriminating. Know what you want and do make it conform to your code of decency, your wonderful ethical code. You don't have to in any way tarnish that code. You don't to get what you want in this world. But men are not aware of that. And they're quite willing to touch it a bit to get what they really want in this world. So here this secret of the sperm is God's creative power. Now don't be shocked if I tell you that that sperm is only the symbol of Jesus Christ. For by him all things are made. And without him there is not anything made that is made. In him is life. There is no other life. In him is life. Well, if I go into a place and suddenly becomes animated, then I must be he. Prior to that, I thought he was on the outside. In some other place. And suddenly, I find myself in a room, and the room is sealed. Well, how did I get into it? You're told in the scripture, he suddenly appeared among the disciples, after the resurrection, and the door was closed. 
That's a cue given to all of us. It's not a man. It's a supernatural power in man. That supernatural power is your own wonderful human imagination. If you're willing to believe it, you could today set out to transform your entire world. But above all things, become extremely selective. Don't just compromise, don't. Extremely selective. The state is there. The tarnished state is there. And the untarnished state is there. Everything possible is there. Why do we read these words in scripture? He has made everything for its purpose. Even the wicked for the day of trouble. If there were no wicked in the world, then creation isn't complete. I don't have to be wicked, but the state is there. I could enter the state and be as wicked as the state allows. I am not the state. I am the fertilizing power, animating and making alive that state. That's why Blake said, in his wonderful vision of the Last Judgment, I do not consider either the just or the wicked, to be in a supreme state, but to be every one of them, states of the sleep, which the soul may fall into in its deadly dreams of good and evil. It falls into these states unwittingly. You, knowing the law, don't fall into a state unwittingly. Enter the state knowingly. Go right into it. If you want to animate it, and make it real. And you're going to a state not just for yourself alone, but for your family, your friends, your, well, anyone in this world. And just leave it. After you fertilize it, what can you do? Let it grow. Fertilize the egg. Don't tamper with it. Just let it grow. So you single out a state today. It's a state of consciousness. You enter it and clothe yourself with it. And let it grow. When I exhausted every human channel to get out of the army, I turned to the only God in the world. And that God is my own wonderful human imagination. In 1942, in the month of December, this direction came down from Washington, D.C., any man over 38 is eligible for discharge, providing his superior officer allows it. If his superior officer, meaning his battalion commander, disallows, there is no appeal beyond his battalion commander. You could not take it, say, to the divisional commander. It stops with the battalion commander. This came down in 1942, in the month of December. They gave a deadline on it. This would come to an end on March the 1st of 1943. So anyone 38 years old before March the 1st, 1943, was eligible. All right? That is Caesar's law. I got my paper, made it out. They had my record, my date. I was born in 1905 on the 19th of February. So I was 38 years old before the 1st of March of 1943. So I was eligible. Turned it into my battalion commander, who was Colonel Theodore Bilbo. His father was a senator from Mississippi. I turned it in. In four hours, it came back, disapproved, and signed the colonel's name. That night, I went to sleep in the assumption that I am sleeping in my apartment house in New York City. I didn't go through the door. I didn't go through the window. I put myself on the bed. I went right into my home that I knew so well, but I conditioned it. I could be there on furlough, a two-week furlough. I didn't want that. I wanted to be there honorably discharged, 
not dishonorably, honorably discharged, and a civilian in this country. So I slept in that assumption at 4, 4.15 in the morning. Here came before my inner eye a piece of paper, not unlike the one that I had signed that day. On the bottom of it was disapproved. Then came a hand from here down, holding a pen. And then the voice said to me, that which I have done, I have done. Do nothing. It scratched out disapproved. I wrote in in big bold script, approved. And then I woke. I did nothing. Nine days later, that same colonel called me in. To close the door, Goddard. Yes, sir. Did you still want to get into the army? I said, yes, sir. He said, you know, the best dressed man in this country wears the uniform of America. I said, yes, sir. You still want to get into the army? Yes, sir. Yes, him to death. As I sat before him. He said, all right, make out another application and you'll be out of the army today. Went back to my captain, told him what the colonel had said, made out another application and he signed it. And that day, I was out of the army, honorably discharged. That's all that I did. I went right into my home as a discharged soldier of our army, and I'm a civilian. I slept that night in my home in New York City, though physically, <clears throat> my body was in Camp Polk, Louisiana. That's how it works. There is a state... I entered the state and fertilized it. No one was hurt. And the colonel, when I went through the door that evening, he came forward and said, well, good luck, Goddard. I will see you in New York City after we have won this war. I said, yes, sir. And that was it. I share this with you to tell you how it works. This is not good and that is wrong. We're living in a world of infinite possibilities. You become discreet. You become selective. You know what you want. You hurt no one. But you must turn to God. And God is your own wonderful human imagination. Choose this day whom you will serve. And they answered, we choose the Lord. You are witnesses against yourself that you have chosen the Lord. We are witnesses against ourselves. For the Lord's only name is I am. But who was actually assuming that he was in his own apartment 2,000 miles away? I am. I am assuming I am, where physically I am not. But the reality of me is not this. The reality of the speaker is his imagination. And I must be where I am in imagination. So the body was in Camp Pope. The reality of me was in that apartment of mine in New York City. You could take this story and multiply it thousands of times. But here, while you are here, I would like to make it so clear that you and you alone are responsible for your own selection. I can teach you the law, that's the law in the nutshell, what I've just told you. But I cannot get behind you and say, no, not that, take this. I can't guide your ship, I must leave you to your choice. And warn you, it carries a risk, unless you take your wonderful code and surround it. Take your choice and make it fit your lovely moral and ethical code. You will not have to compromise. So this is the secret of the sperm. You aren't going to find it under the microscope. Now I'm going to see it go through. It's all imagination. This whole vast world that seems so real and solid and independent of our perception of it is all within our imagination. And so you single out the state 
you want to activate. You go in under that state and know it as yourself, and it becomes alive. Then you return to whatever you're doing in the world of Caesar, and that egg has been fertilized. And in a way that you do not know consciously, it will simply develop, break the shell, and come forward as a fact in our life. You try it today with a friend, a friend in need, someone who has no job or needs more income because of obligations, try it. And you need not tell him that you've done it, leave him alone and have the satisfaction of seeing your friend with a nice job and making more money. Do it with everything in this world because you have the power and the right. The power is your imagination. Paul describes Jesus Christ as the power of God and the wisdom of God. Well, this is power. This is creative power. Because here is a man who has all the power in the world. He could say no from now until the war is over. So when it happened to me in nine days, I wrote a friend of mine who was my age, who was just as eligible, and I wrote him and I told him what I had done. He never answered my letter. He's a Freudian. By Freudian, I mean he studied with Freud. He was steeped in the so-called facts of life, all based upon sex. He knew nothing of this higher level. So I told him what I had done. He got out when the other millions got out after the war. Because he used to come to my meetings in New York City. And he said, you know, Neville, I like hearing you. I like listening to your talks. But you know what I do? I hold the seat and put my feet right down into the carpet to keep my sense of the reality and the profundity of things. You take me out of this reality. You mustn't do that. So he likes the reality. He was in the army. He wanted to get out and couldn't. And I am unreal. And I got out. So I'm sharing with you the real reality. If Freud only knew of these intensities of creation on higher levels, compared to this level here, where well you can't, these incredible intensities on the highest level, when you're creating, and you create all within yourself. You're not a divided image. But to create, it's all within yourself. And compared to this level, this level, is like simply, well, two out-of-season slugs. That's this level. But on the higher level, it's all intense, fantastic creations. And there you see the vortices that bind man on his body. There you see unnumbered, you could never count, the unnumbered vortices that cram creation. And there they are gathering intensity or rather density, to make what they're gathering apparent in this world. They're already apparent on the higher levels, but to make them apparent here, they gather density. So here, in a very simple way, imagining creates reality. In the most minute form, there isn't a thing in this world that is now real to us, that was not once only imagined. So today, start controlling your imagination. And do not entertain even the idle thought, because no one sees it. Read the eighth chapter of the book of Ezekiel. This thought no one saw it too. <clears throat> and he said, Son of man, do you see what the elders of the house of Israel are doing? Everyone in his own chamber of imagery. And they say no one sees us. The Lord has turned from us. There's no Lord on the outside looking. You know what you're doing. That's the Lord seeing. He knows exactly what you're doing because you and he are one. God became man. That man may become God. So the house of Israel said, let us go into our chamber of darkness, with all these abominations, and create, because the Lord doesn't see us, 
He has forsaken us. They forgot the Lord. The Lord is your own wonderful human imagination. And there's only one Lord. So you sit in the silence for a moment. And you think, well, I can't be seen. I can imagine unlovely things about that one, the other one. Don't for one moment think the Lord doesn't see it because you see it. And you and he are one. And he's creating at that very moment. And you're bringing out of your own deep the things that you are fertilizing. Now, about a week ago, I suggested a certain technique that I learned from my old friend Abdullah. Sitting physically in one place and assuming that I am physically seated in another place. And go from place to place. After a while, it becomes so easy. And then you can open your eyes at the place where physically you really are not. And when you do so, you open that eye with a shock. If I am seated in a big chair in my living room, and imagine I am seated in the bedroom, but I want the shop, I open my eye while imagining I'm seated in the bedroom. If I open my eye when I imagine I'm seated in the living room where the body was in the beginning, there's no shock. But there's a shock to open your eye where the body is not, because it seems so real to you. And this is how you exercise this talent. Go into any state. So in essence, this being the last day, I brought you many things I've heard and experienced in the last year. Bringing stories of my friend, Kratcher, stories of others, my own, but really, the base hasn't changed. I can't change the base. The base is still imagining creates reality. That God and man are one. And all that we behold, though it appears without, it is within, in our imagination, of which this world of mortality is but a shadow. So when one takes off this little garment, where do you think they're going to go? They are in the only reality in the world, in their imagination. And they'll live in a world of imagination. And the day will come, they'll take it off from this level forever. For they'll rise completely into an imaginative world, where everything is subject to their imaginative power. So here, this is educative darkness, for the purpose of learning how to create. And you aren't being judged, if you create something unlovely, but create. But why create something unlovely when you know you could, in some wonderful way, still get your goal and put it into a lovely frame? You need not take away your wonderful ethical code. Within the framework of your code, you can put your picture. So you'll never be ashamed of what you've accomplished. So many today in this world, they wouldn't discuss how they got what they have. They wouldn't. They are ashamed of it. So if you have a goal like Millikan, take Millikan's wonderful statement and repeat it over and over until it becomes a part of you. That's all that he did, so he told my friend, and things opened for him. He was the one person who could see there was a potential in this study of cosmic rays. And so he devoted himself to it. And while he gave his all to that, the world was looking at him. And then money started pouring into him. So he died a noble soul, one that was honored. And anyone he left behind, like his sons, his daughters, and those related to him, are proud of the fact that they had a man called Milliken, who was part of their physical descent. Are there any questions, please? You tell us that we play all the parts. In my present state of consciousness, I would not want to play the part of the violent person. Do we escape that with our understanding? The question is, if we play all the parts, 
Can we escape playing the violent part? My dear, I will say, the violent part is being played by God. And you and God are one. We learn eventually to play it more beautifully, as we would avoid certain notes on the piano. But don't destroy the note. You need it for some other piece you're going to play. You can take a discord and resolve it into a distance. If I took the notes from that piano that caused the discord, in the hope I would never make another discord, I can't play the piano. So everything must be present, including violence. It tells us in the 10th chapter of Isaiah, Behold the Assyrian, the staff in his hand, is the rod of my anger. He uses everyone to bring to pass what man is miscreating. Certainly, my dear, but there was no other being to play the part. If I select to play the part of uh, the horrible beast of the world, God and I are one. Therefore, God is playing the part. He submits himself to my choice because he became me that I may be as he is. He's infinite love, but while I'm still asleep, he plays a sacrificial part of playing the parts I select. So there's only God to play all the parts. That's the sacrifice that's told us in the 53rd of Isaiah. Put all the things upon his back. The question here? The question. Oh, I... You have taught us that we in the 6,000 year span that we play all the parts. Yeah. In my present state of consciousness, I would like to avoid the violent part. In the 6,000 years, the question is this. I have taught you to believe that the journey takes 6,000 years. As Blake said, I behold the visions of my deadly sleep of 6,000 years, dazzling around thy skirts like a serpent of precious stones and gold. I know it is myself, O oh my Creator and Redeemer. So if 6,000 years is the length of the journey, and within that six, all parts are being played, can I avoid these horrible parts? Certainly. But in our ignorance, we play them, we fall into them. You will give a banquet one day, the Messianic banquet, everyone will give. And you will see a sea of human imperfection. And you will redeem them. You will play the blind, the halt, the withered, everything. They're all waiting for you to walk by. As you walk by, all are molded into perfection. For there were garments that you played. And they're now invited to Messiah's banquet. Because you have risen from it all. You see, you're something infinitely greater than any being that you see in this world. You are a supernatural being who is God, playing these parts. The actor is not Hamlet. The actor goes home and leaves Hamlet in the closet. Any other questions, please? Well, I tell you again, the breathing technique. I find if I hold before my mind's eye what I would like to activate. And I make it so that it really thrills me. A conversation between two friends discussing the fulfillment of their dream, which is my dream for them. And then you breathe in and you breathe out. You inhale and exhale. It's a complete personal Thing. I can't give you the numbers. You don't do it once, twice, or 50 times. It's entirely up to you. 
to breathe in and breathe out while you're listening to this conversation and bring yourself to the limit of a thrill. Then with one deep, deep inhalation, your whole body explodes. Every little atom seems to open and something goes out. As you're told in scripture, who has touched me? For I perceive virtue has gone out of me. You touched it on the inside. You made it real and you exploded. It comes with the last inhalation. But this is something that is very personal. You must try it. If two are working from different angles yeah. for a, a common goal for someone else, no, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. I have friends who will call me and ask me to hear good news for them. I know from their own confession in the past they haven't broken that little trick, but they want to be sure. So they call the Christian Science Practitioner, the Unity Practitioner, uh, Science of Mind Practitioner. They call all the practitioners. In the hope that one is going to hit it. <laughs> A complete absence of faith on the part of the one who wants the help. My teaching is not based upon theory. I did not sit down to work out a workable philosophy of life. My teaching is based upon the experience of Scripture. I have experienced Scripture. And Scripture is not the product of human wisdom. It's not. It's revelation. But unnumbered isms in the world, brilliant minds, wonderful minds, they sat down and gathered themselves together to work out what they consider the right path. And so, all these isms are based upon just such human wisdom. The Bible is not human wisdom. In its search for the meaning of life and for God, the human mind could never have conceived of the story of the gospel. Never could he conceive it. It's something that was revealed to man. As Paul said, I did not hear it from a man, nor was I taught it by a man, but it came through a revelation of Jesus Christ. He unveils himself in you, as you. And you've been looking for him on the outside all through the centuries. And suddenly it happens. And it's so different in prospect from what it comes to be seen in retrospect. After it's happened to you, well then you know. So my teaching is not speculation. I'm not theorizing. I'm telling you what I know from experience. And it's all scripture. Because the world thinks they are grown scripture. They will say, what? That's an old book, a myth. That belongs to the dead ages. Let us get something new. And so they'll get something new. You'll find other isms springing up too. All over the world. Did you hear the question? Is this system a system that can be used towards spiritual translation? You cannot in any way hasten your spiritual growth. Spiritual maturity is a gradual state from a God of tradition to a God of experience. You can't possibly, by not eating certain things or by eating certain things, or by attending certain classes, or not attending certain classes. In other words, hasten your spiritual growth. It's coming. What you can do with this principle, that's why I call it both the law and the promise. The promise comes first. The law comes 400 years later. 400 is lifting the cross, as long as I wear it. And so he gives me a law to cushion the blows, while I wait for the promise of the Father. 
And the promise of the Father is to give me himself, as though there were no other, just God the Father. But all these translations and these extra sensory perceptions and all these things, they don't interest me really. What would it matter? UCLA, three weeks ago, they gave a little weekend group. They charged a hundred dollars three da three days. And they had, I think, five speakers. It was crowded to the gunnels. Over five hundred attended the class at UCLA. And not one man on that panel, not one, is a man of vision. In his present state, a vision would scare him to death. But he knows all about extrasensory perception and talks about it learnedly. But I've always maintained there's an awful lot of learned ignorance in this world. <laughs> Any other questions, please? Now, my attendance here at your lecture this year was spoiled by the fact that I went into the hospital last week and stayed there for five days. Now, of all the nuns in the world who go to the hospital, I certainly didn't plan it this time, and I don't think. But you have told us that we do not recognize our own harvest. Now, my question is this. To, we, to keep us from reaping these unwanted harvests, how do we make ourselves more conscious to ourselves? Well, I would not say this is actually your answer. But many a person coming to my meetings over the years, I started on the second day of February, 1938. And it's been an unbroken series since, from coast to coast. They come to my meeting, and my terminology differs from theirs. I speak of Jesus Christ more intimately. I bring him down and close the gap between Christ and myself. And treat him as my own wonderful human imagination, filled with love. That shocks people. They go out at that moment, never to hear me again. And if they can possibly say to someone else, don't go and hear him, they will. I'm not saying in the interval that you've been coming here, I didn't say something that annoyed you. And you turned your back that night with a little pledge, I go and hear him. So when you wanted most to hear me, you go to the hospital. <laughs> That's how it works. It'd be nice if you went to the hospital when you wanted them to go. <laughs> but I'm here for a short interval. I'm not saying you did it. But I wouldn't even ask for a confession. For the simple reason, self-justification is the voice of hell. And nobody confesses honestly anyway. My dear, peace is a state of consciousness as much as war. To animate and to activate peace, the human imagination must enter that state and believe in its reality and dwell in it as though we saw headlines that in some way that you and I do not understand, they got together. We are reading one side of the ledger over here and they're reading another side over there. You and I don't know. All you know and I know what we see in the papers. And if you have a good memory, it's horrible. Because you go back, it's contradiction after contradiction after contradiction. One fellow flies in from the Orient and he tells us one thing. The same man goes back two weeks later, comes back, tells us an entirely different story. So we don't know. And fortunately, in a way, our memory isn't long enough to remind you of what you said a week ago. William Butler Yates, oh, he has a great list. Yeah. 
Yes. He wrote a series of essays, and he called the book itself Ideas of Good and Evil. But the chapter from which I took what I quoted is called Magic. There are series of essays, but the book itself is called Ideas of Good and Evil. You can revise it. I'll give you a story. A friend of mine comes from the hills of Hollywood, down to sunset to take the usual two-mile walk every day. He can't walk on the hills. They're unbearable. But on the flat of sunset, he could walk. He comes and he parks the car and takes his walk. As he parks the car, he starts off down to sunset, and a young girl in a little uh, sports model, she can't see clearly the back of her, and she's backing out but she's backing out at almost 40 miles an hour, right straight onto the street. But he gets right in line. Next thing he knew, he's in the middle of sunset. He got himself up, went back to the car, and drove home. He said, I was in excruciating pain. My wife canceled her appointment with the hairdresser. I thought, I can't hear you tomorrow night. What is happening to me now? Do I have a concussion? I've never had one before. So I don't know, I do not know if what I'm having now is one. But I thought I should call the doctor, I should do this, I should do the other. He said, no, I'll revise it. He got on his bed and relaxed, went over the scene. When he came to the place where she's pulling out at that rapid pace, he went this way at her. As a man of my age would to a young girl in a car, he wouldn't bore her out, he would go this way. So he cautioned her not to do that. You could injure someone. And she thanked him, stopped the car, and then he walked by and took his walk. He walked 20 minutes later. There wasn't a bruise on him, not one sign of the accident. It hadn't happened. As far as he's concerned, he remembers it and can tell it, but in the picture itself, he rubbed it out. He revised it. Until next year. Thank you.